Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming to this presentation. The title is Distributed Message Broker Design, and my name is Dmitry Sagatelian. I'm a certified LabVIEW architect, a LabVIEW champion, and a regular presenter at NA Weeks, CLA Summits, and San Francisco Bay Area LabVIEW user group. Coming from a computer science and software engineering background, I'm passionate about bringing contemporary software engineering methods and practices to the LabVIEW community. My main areas of interest include actor programming and using agile design principles to develop better LabVIEW architectures and code. Back in 2009, I quit my last full-time job and started Arctur Technologies. I had been using solid design principles on customer projects most of that time. And I'm quite happy with the outcome as solid principles helped me to consistently deliver lean and scalable customer solutions capable of adapting to requirement changes at incremental cost. And as a LabVIEW consultant, I can help you master solid design faster and with less pain. So today's presentation would be about a message broker. Uh, I went to a prior presentation by James Powell about his messenger library and was amazed at that we are touching about almost the same topics down to details in both presentations. So you will help some, you will have some deja vu moments, but the difference is we're coming from different backgrounds and we approach things a bit different and definitely package our solution different. So probably you'll get some stereo vision from those two presentations, how to do things or how not to do things and what are the problems in how you do them. So the plan today is I will first compare three important messaging design patterns. Then I will talk about design of a local message broker that facilitates message exchange within a single application. Then dive into challenges and details of a distributed message broker extension and complete presentation with describing message broker testing and benchmarking results and the amount of work it took me to get this thing working. This is my first presentation on the Hopin platform. I'm sorry for any sloppiness and glitches you may experience today. Uh, when, pre when presenting on Hopin main stage, there is about 10 to 15 seconds lag between me saying or showing something and you getting the audio video stream on your laptops. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please message them to our moderator, Sarah, and I will try to answer them at the end uh, of this presentation. There is a break after this hour, so we can stay on the main stage a little longer for Q&A. And there is also a breakout session planned. So if somebody wants to talk in a more conversation-like environment, uh, please come to the breakout room. OK, so let's start. The first important design pattern with messaging is the mediator design pattern. A mediator defines an object that controls how a set of objects interact. In this example, you have the air traffic control tower acting as a mediator object. Uh, it talks to each and every plane approaching uh, the airport, but planes don't talk to each other. And control tower imposes constraints on arriving and departing planes. Uh, in this way, mediator pattern promotes object decoupling and it is solid friendly, and that's why I like it. Uh, many of you use this pattern in your projects, whether you know it or not, because this is what actor framing, actor framework promotes. It promotes actor hierarchies when a caller talks to all its 
actors, but actors don't talk with each, with each other. So you probably know this pattern. The second pattern is an event aggregator design pattern. The thing with mediator is that it couples two things into the same object. It facilitates message exchange and it implements business rules. But there is a very important software engineering principle. It's called separation of concerns, which tells us that an object or a module should do only one thing. So mediator does at least two. And if you take out the business logic of the mediator object, then you get the event aggregator design pattern. And its sole purpose is to facilitate exchange of messages between actors. There are two types of event aggregators. Uh, the first one is content-based when object, when actors subscribe to, to messages based on their content. This is typical for social network kind of applications. In engineering, we are better served with topic-based applications, topic-based uh, event aggregators. So I will talk only about that one. So as you can see, you have a bunch of publishers on the left and a bunch of subscribers on the right. An event aggregator maintains a list of topics. What this design allows is that it decouples publishers and subscribers from each other because a publisher doesn't know, doesn't need to know where his subscriber is and vice versa. They only need to know location of the event aggregator. It decouples topic lifetime from publishers and subscribers. A publisher doesn't have to be up and running for a subscriber to subscribe to its topic. This is really important. It supports one-to-one, one-to-many, and many-to-many -many message routing modes. Each object may publish and subscribe to arbitrary number of topics, and it removes constraints on object instantiation order, which is really, really important in case of complex systems when you can paint yourself in the corner by creating dependency loops that would define in which order actors need to be instantiated. The third pattern is a message broker design pattern. Uh, its difference from event aggregator is that when you're using event aggregator, your actors need to be designed to understand each other messages. Uh, but if you have an actor that was designed for a different application and you want to reuse it in another one, it's often hard to make changes and keep that object reusable. So in this case, you might be better using a message broker because a message broker is concerned with connecting incompatible or independently designed subsystems. And what it specifically does, it provides you means and opportunities to translate messages on a per subscription basis. Uh, you can think of a message broker as a wrapper around an event aggregator when publisher creates and publishes a message, message broker translates it and uses event aggregator to route it to the subscriber. So that's the basic idea and the relationship of these three patterns. Uh, message translation is a generic term and it may include many things. The first one is substituting one message for another. Uh, the other one is translating one message format into another. For example, a publisher may publish data in XML format, but subscriber wants to use a JSON. 
formats, so you translate the formats. Uh, it is also message filtering, for example, by subject or by other properties of a message. Another use case is reducing message rate. For example, publisher publishes a message at 50 Hertz, but a subscriber only needs a one Hertz update or an update when the value of the message changes like 1% from its prior value. So you can put in the message filter that would reduce the message rate and minimize the traffic, message traffic that goes in your system. And yet another one is encrypting messages that have sensitive data payload. So there are plenty of use of this uh, message translation techniques. But the challenge is how and where do you perform message translation without altering subsystem code? You can put translation to the publisher or subscriber, but then you need to tweak them and they stop being reusable because you're creating another flavor of your actor. And now you have to su support two, three or more flavors depending on how many places you use your uh, so-called reusable actors. So the challenge stands and I'll talk about it a little bit later. So what is the architecture of a message broker I built for my reuse code library? It is centered around using two abstract, four abstract classes. Of course, you have the messages. Then you have message transports, which allow you to send and receive messages from actors. Then you have the optional message filter. I just talked about it. And then you have the message broker interface. These are actor classes, abstract classes, not interfaces. Uh, and they don't need to be interfaces. I can talk about this later. So what happens next? You have a bunch of actors, many actors, and they issue subscribe and subscribe, register to publish and then register publisher request to the message broker. And they supply the message transport that they need to be either, that they need the message to be delivered to in case of subscription or publishing. So actors call the message broker interface and then they're subscribed and or uh, registered as publishers. Uh, the next layer is the message broker implementation. This is, it's called a tap message broker, does matter why I call it that way, does add any meaning to it. What matters is that this is a by reference class it's not an actor, it's not a message handling loop, it's just a stateful class. And it has a special interface that wraps a DVR to the message broker object. And this message broker interface implements the, extends the uh, abstract class interface. So that's pretty much it. Uh, it's pretty simple, not too many objects. And what it allows, it allows asynchronous message publishing when you spin off a publisher actor internally by message broker for publishing for broadcasting messages. You can do a synchronous message publishing when you publish directly from your actor message handling loop. Uh, and you can optionally do publisher side message translation. So that's all there is to the structure. Four abstract classes, two big classes for the message broker and whatever actors you write for your application. Now, this is how it works. This is the command and message flow with the message broker and your publishers and subscribers in case of asynchronous publishing. What happens is, Wait a second, let me zoom in. 
There are two methods that a subscriber can use to either subscribe or unsubscribe from the topic. To subscribe, you need to supply a topic name. Uh, the message transport, normally this is a web UQ or a user event mechanism. You, you, you supply it to the message broker and an optional message filter. Each subscription is defined by a topic name and by the subscriber identity, so they are not bundled together. When your message broker gets a subscribe request, it checks against the topic list it's maintaining. And if it's a new topic, then it creates an entry for this topic. And then, oops, I'm sorry. I jumped too quickly. And then it spawns a topic actor, that's internal actor of the message broker that maintains the subscriber list and acts on behalf of all the publishers. Now, when a publisher registered to publish, it supplies the topic name and it receives back from the message broker a message transport like a QRFNUM, which it would be used to sending its messages to the topic actor. Essentially, this is the queue for the topic actor. After Subscribers subscribe and publishers register to publish. The publisher creates a message. This is a double value and sends it using the message transport that got from message broker. Topic actor receives it and it broadcasts it to all the subscribers. So there is certain asymmetry between subscription and publishing. And because of this asymmetry, Actors with different implementations of message handling loops can communicate with each other without any friction. A subscriber could be a user-defined event after template, and a publisher could be a LabUQ message handler, and there would be no problem whatsoever. This is the first mode I implemented back in 2015, uh, but then I quickly followed by a blocking mode because the previous mode requires to send the message twice. It has to make two hops to get to its destination. You send it to the topic actor and then topic actor broadcasts it to subscriber and that takes about twice the time. So sometimes it's useful, sometimes it's not. So a similar design with the blocking message transfer, when publisher actually publishes messages from, its, from within its own message handling group. And this is implemented really simple in a simple way because a message broker creates a special message transfer for blocking publishers, which is not an actor, not a message handling group. It's not an asynchronous entity is just a by reference object. But it maintains the list of subscribers and it is directly called from the publisher. That's the difference. This is the optimal way to communicate between two actors if you want to make that communication private. Now let's look at what are the message transport classes. They are the standard ones. You can see that I have in my library implementation for the notifier, queue, lossy queue, and user-defined events. And they are really simple. This is implementation of a send message for the queue-based message transport. And this is for the event-based message transport. One other thing to Notice is that I have actually two abstract classes, a sender class and a transport class, which extends it. Senders only allow to send messages. There is no way you can hijack a message by reading it from this 
message transport because it doesn't provide this service. And the message transport implementation actually has the get next call, which allows to call it within the message handling loop of the actor. This is kind of similar how actor framework initially did the incur the cure so that uh, actors that are posting messages to another actor cannot read their own, its own message. So this was a simple case. Now a more complicated case for a message transport is, for example, Now, that would be the next slide. Okay. So this is the message queue in user defined. Now let's look at the messages. I have a bunch of messages that are already defined and ready to use out of the box. It's the booleans, booleans array, doubles, strings, errors, and a blocking request message. They all are children of the Art message abstract class that only has one field, which is the subject. All messages have a subject. You can filter them by subject. And then each implementation of a message has its own method, like accessor methods. Get Boolean method just returns the value of the Boolean inside the message. Set Boolean is like a message constructor. You pass it the subject and the value, and it creates an object of this message type. And print, print is a virtual method you implement, need to implement it by every message type. It just provides you an ASCII representation of the message value, which is really handy for logging and doing other, uh, other things when you need to have an, when you need to have a string representation of a message. This is a simple message. A more complicated one would be a blocking message request. So what it does, you send a blocking message and you wait inside your actor for a reply. This is a dangerous thing, dangerous thing to do if you do it indiscriminately, but there are safe use cases in which your code really gets really way more simple than if you didn't have this message. So implementation would look like this. Sending a blocking request message. First step, you create a lossy queue size of one, then you send the message to the destination, and then you wait on this lossy queue for a reply from the destination or until the timeout occurs. And then when you get the message or a timeout, you check if the message is the type you need, and then it returns uh, to the caller or you get an error. Uh, the send response that's done by the receiver of the original message is just sending a reply back to the sender. So this is really simple. And you can easily add your own messages to, uh, to your code. Now, what about actors? Actors are not part of the message broker. They are built on top of the message broker. Uh, I have two message, two actor templates I use. One is the is based on the LabVIEW queues, message handling loop, and another on user events. They are not compatible. There are two separate branches. And then you extend those templates with your own actor code. And all all your actors need is to call the message broker API which is decoupled from a message broker implementation. So the template, what the templates allow, they allow you to send a command to 
an actor, arbitrary actor, if you have their message transport, send a command to self and send a command to your host or caller in the actor frame or speak. You can also uh, register for topic to publish and you can register to subscribe. And these are the message transports that are needed by the actor to implement this stuff. And when you create your own actor from the plan from the template, you add the fields you need to to the private data, and this enables communicating with other actors. And using this approach is pretty straightforward. As you can see, you can send a command to self. That's just the command name. It has an optional argument. You send command to the host. You can publish a command to a billboard topic, or you can take create a message of arbitrary type and send it to whatever message transport you got ready. And this is how you get, receive and process the messages. A user event happens that gives you a message. You check the subject. If it's double one or double two, you know it's of type double. You check that it's of type double. And then you unpack that message and process it inside the use case. Or if it's not of that type, you throw an error. Plain and simple. Now, a more interesting thing. And the problem is, how do you really connect actors into a system if you have a complex messaging topology? As you saw from the prior slides, in order to send and receive messages, we need to get this message transport objects. Without them, you cannot receive or save. And the problem is, how do you translate your messaging topology into actor data so they can communicate with each other without actually knowing anything about each other. So this is an example where you have a main UI actor, actor A, actor B, and actor B has two worker loops, consumer and producer. The black arrows are actor to actor communication or actor to worker loop communication. They're private. Nobody can sniff on those communication channels. And of course, actors and worker loops can send commands to themselves. But the main GUI is also publishing on the billboard topic, topic C, topic D, and it takes messages from billboard topic A and topic B and so forth. So that's a pretty elaborate communication uh, topology. And let's see how it may be configured so that objects can, actors can communicate. What helps us to implement this is the dependency injection pattern. Many people already talked about it. I think there would be some talks toward the end of today. Uh, but in a nutshell, a dependency injection pattern is a container. When you work on a project, you make a conscious decision to separate your project code into two parts. The bigger part contains all reusable objects. They are represented by these holes in the Swiss cheese cartoon. And these are dependency and sub-actors. And the project-specific code. Reusable objects should not know anything about their context or who they communicate with in order to be truly reusable. But this part, pardon me, this part, application specific part, knows exactly who can talk to who and knows what type the actors is and how to configure them, et cetera, et cetera. Usually this container is called an assembler class. And it's very simple to create it. It needs only five methods. 
first it initializes itself and what it does it creates and configures all system wide subsystems like configuration management whether you read from ini files or from a database the configuration files it does initialize the loggers the error handling stuff and messaging support the second call would be to a bring up method where all methods where all actors and runtime objects are created configured because you already have the configuration from the first step and passed to each other which is called by fancy word injection that's where dependency injections come from but in a nutshell is just an act of passing an object to another object in its constructor arguments that would be constructor injection or a set function with which will be called a setter injection and then assembler run method starts actors in the order it sees fit because it knows which one should be started first uh, the next method when everything stopped running is the teardown when all these things are stopped and the assembler destructor actually takes down all the system-wide uh, subsystems and it closes the error logging last so you get the most errors logged before your application quits so that is dependency injection and i'm using it i'm using the assembler class on each application to create all actors and objects and configure and bind them together so let's see how this works this is an example of the assembler bring up method it starts with the configuration of my messaging topologies i have three actors this is their names and i define what are the topic names for communicating between the actors they are marked private You'll see what this means later and all the public topics here. This is how I define configuration on the project in the project scope. And then you start executing, you start executing the assembler bring up. Its first step is creating the message broker instance. That's what it does. And it creates all the topics. The topics that are used to communicate between actors and the public topics. Now, the interesting thing is if something is marked private, uh, instead of returning that private thing, because you know, if you know the topic name, you can snoop on it, it generates a random string that is specific to this instantiation of your application and nobody can snoop on it after that. This is security by obscurity. And in this simple case, it works pretty nice. So you start the message broker and create all the topics. The next step is you need to create and configure your top level actor, which is the main GUI. And there are two steps to doing this. These names are the application scope names. And you first need to translate it into the actor scope. Since application GUI knows a lot about this application, there is no difference between application scope names and actor scope names. After mapping the names, it instantiates the actor UI, which splits the topic names into topics that need to be used for subscription and for publishing and an open connections call creates all those all those message transports for publishing and subscribing so your main ui object is configured the next step is creating 
both actor A and actor B. It's done in a similar manner. Uh, the difference is that actor A and B might have been created independently of the main GUI. So they use internally different names. They don't know about the topic C. One actor knows it as a data in, and another actor knows it as a worker out. So you do this mapping of application scope names into actor scope names. And then similarly, you split them into publish, uh, publishable and subscribable topics, and you create the message transports here. So this is how you configure and connect actors and create them. After that, the system is not running, but it is ready to run in the run method. So this step, what the steps allows you, it allows you to translate this complex messaging topology into the data structures and private data of the actors that allow actors to interact with each other. The next topic is, let's talk about message translation. So a simple example is you have actor B and main UI and your actor B generates, publishes messages from ECU engine control unit on RPM subject at 50 Hertz and on a fuel level subject at one Hertz. But your main UI only wants to receive ECU RPM values to update its UI when the value of the RPM changes more than 1%. Otherwise, you're just shuttling messages, burning your CPU clocks, and not really adding any value to the UI. So how this can be done? What you can do is create a filter specific message filter method, which takes the ECU message in from actor B, unpacks it, checks if the value changed more than 1%. If not, it returns the discard message true. If it did, it returns false and the message gets published. So this is a very simple piece of code that allows you to filter messages. Second example is, let's say you have main UI designed to work with actor A1 implementation, which sends it a Boolean message that contains a Boolean, binary Boolean number. And for some reason you want to call a flavor of actor, of an actor that does the same thing, but it was designed for a different application and it returns a string message which says, which says build sensor on and off. If you don't want to make changes to this actor, what you need to do is create another message filter that takes the message by the subject build sensor is a subject. It checks whether it's a string message, if it's yet, is a string message, takes a string and translates through false string into a Boolean value, creates a message, new message, Boolean message that the UI understands and pushes us out for publishing. That's pretty straightforward and easy to implement. Now, where is the benefit of this approach? This is a UML diagram of your application. You have the application assembler class, which creates all the actors. And when created and started, this actor start exchanging messages. But this application assembler also creates two message filters because it knows that in this application, the main UI actor would talk to actor A2, which creates and sends string messages. So it creates a message filter that would be translating them one into another, which keeps the actor A2 and main GUI unchanged and statically decoupled from each other. Same thing with uh, the message range 
filtering, but you only have one dependency here. So in this case, you in, in this solution, actor classes may be reused by different applications. Message filter classes are application specific and belong to the assembler model. Oh, model. Application assembler class creates, configures, connects, and runs all actor objects. Application assembler class creates message filter objects and passes them to subscribe topic calls on per subscription basis. This is really important. Message filter arguments in message broker subscribe methods are optional. If you don't need to filter messages or translate them, just leave it empty. And main GUI actor, as I said, and all the other actors are statically decoupled from one another. So this is the solution on how to keep your uh, classes decoupled from each other and reusable while injecting some, injecting some type of customization into your project. OK, so we're done with the local broker. I'll probably go faster because we're running out of time. So the distributed more broker message broker idea is as follows. In a typical T scenario, you have two executables, A and B. Each has an actor. And if you want these actors to communicate with each other, you create a network proxy for each of them. Uh, you send a message to the proxy. It gets forwarded through TCP IP, and the actor receives them on its queue, on its level queue. So that's a typical one. But there is a problem. If you want to move actor A back into executable B or vice versa, you also need to take the network proxy and manage it and reconfigure it, which makes your, uh, which makes your actor code location dependent. So the question is, can we make our actors truly location agnostic? And the answer is yes, if we properly design as a distributed message broker package. And the idea of message broker is the following. Each application has a local copy, local message broker object. And message broker, distributed message broker encapsulates managing all the network proxies and actors in your applications are now independent of their location because the only thing they know is the message transport by which to send messages through the message broker. So that's the idea. How does this extension look? This is what we had in the prior slides. That's the local message broker. All you need to do is create an extension of the local message broker which would introduce like a new constructor and a new destructor. And you need to extend or override the message broker interface method by overriding subscribe and unsubscribe. You only need to change functionality of the subscription part of the message broker, publisher part remains the same. And actors really don't know which message broker flavor, this or this, they were running with because they're decoupled through the message broker interface. And when you instantiate a local message broker, instead of returning a by value instance of an object, it returns a by value instance of its interface, which is a wrapper around a DVR. And same here, it returns a different DVR uh, stateless object that can be propagated through your diagrams and shared across different places in the code base. So let's look at how this works. If two actors are in the same application, one actor subscribes the topic, the other actor 
register to publish, and they exchange messages directly. It's important to know that messages don't go through the message broker. They are sent directly from one actor to another. Now, with distributed message broker, it is somewhat more complicated. You have a local copy for the distributed message broker here and here. And when the main, when an actor subscribes to Topix X, uh, distributed message broker subscribes to all local publishers on that topic, but it also subscribes all the gateway actors that it spawns when it starts. So they get subscribed to the topic X and then they, pardon me, and then they forward the subscription request to the remote counterpart, remote gateway actor which requests to be subscribed to topic X. And when actor B publishes a message on topic X, gateway actor text takes it on behalf of the main UI actor, forwards it to the gateway actor on the other side, and that one forwards it to uh, the subscriber. So that's pretty uh, simple, but a lot more work to do. But there is a problem with this approach. You really don't know at this point when you get a message forwarded from a remote gateway where to send it because you lost your subscriber address message transfer. So how do you get around it? Let's look at the details. And the, I really like this solution. It's kind of, I think it's elegant. When an actor subscribes to a topic, it passes the name of the topic, its own message transport, where it wants to receive the message, and the optional message filter, publish side message filter. Subscribe request goes to the local gateway. It is forwarded to remote gateway. And at this point, remote gateway needs to subscribe to this topic by itself. It creates a request to subscribe to topic X with the remote gateway uh, message transport and the message filter. And then, and then the distributed message broker forwards this request to actor B, which then publishes your stuff. And when you publish it, it goes like this, like this, like this, but this message it, that is for the, it contains the remote gateway message transport, not the subscriber message transport. So that's a problem. And there is a simple way to solve it. And that method is employing message filter mechanism. Because what you can do, your remote gateway can create its own custom filter that packages the sender request of the center message transport, which is specific to this executable and the original message filter. And it is stored in the uh, subscriber, in the publisher or uh, subscriber list. And when an actor B wants to publish a message, what happens, the message it publishes is packaged into another message that includes this data. It's, that packaged message is forwarded to remote gateway through TCP IP and local gateway unpacks it and uses this data, uses the address to send the, the originally created message. So that's a nice solution. It's implemented, it's working, and the code is pretty simple. So what classes are required to implement this? Uh, the thing I have right now is a met distributed message broker implementation that uses uh, network, and, uh, network streams to forward messages across executable boundaries. You have the message broker that has a single message gateway repository. And when the message broker starts, it is, should be configured for 
it should be configured to connect with all executables it's need to connect to maybe one, two, three, whatever number of executables. So the repository creates a message gateway for each connection to another executable. And it has two objects in it, a gateway reader and a gateway writer, which shut all these specific package messages across the executable boundary. And you need a special message filter that is the same for all the gateway types. So that's pretty much it. That's not much. It was easy to implement. There might be an improved version when you want to decouple from network streams and it just requires introducing an abstract class from a reader, gateway reader, and a gateway writer and implementing those interfaces with the classes I already have hardwired into the message gateway. Uh, I don't think I have time to go over this, but what this sequence diagram shows is how the system is, boot, is started and how it connects, send, sends messages across the executable boundary and is stored down. If you're interested, we can talk about this in more detail at the breakout session. Okay, next subject, really quick, unit test. I have five classes in the distributed, in local and distributed message broker that have unit tests with a total of 47 unit test cases. I use my special way of creating unit tests. I think I presented it a couple of years ago in the CLA summit. We can talk about this, for example, later. Uh, it looks like this. This is a unit test for publishing methods to topics. What you do, you create your mockups, and then you create topic A, topic B, and then you register to publish on the other topic. And then you do it. You publish two messages, and then you get all the messages and compare if the published message on topic A matches what topic B received and vice versa. So that's a pretty complicated unit test. Oh, this expression is pretty powerful. And the unit test really didn't take much time to create, but they really helped a lot because I was doing it from the very beginning while designing the system. Now the next, I think this is most interesting topic, the benchmarks. It's very hard to estimate the throughput and message rate you can achieve by your messaging system. So what I did, I created a message broker benchmark application. And the purpose was to model and measure message propagation delays across the system to stress test message broker implementation because unit tests don't stress test the system. To verify there are no memory leaks when you run your system for a long time, like a day or two, or maybe an hour, and measure specific performance effects when you do changes to optimize your code. So it produces a bunch of plots and gathers a bunch of data. The most interesting is the propagation delay histogram. What it tells you is what percent of messages have this propagation delay between the moment they are created and sent to an actor and then received by an actor and unpacked for uh, analysis. In this case, this is a batch of 1,000 messages that were sent by 10 worker loops using LabVIEWQs at a rate of nine milliseconds per message. And this is the fastest time. This is the slowest time. The best case is your messages arrive in 22 and a half microseconds. That's really fast. The median time is 42 microseconds. And the slowest message here arrived in half a millisecond. In the worst case scenario, you have a different distribution 
The fastest is 97, median is 250, and the slowest about the same. I ran some benchmarks and here you can see a message propagation delay as a function of message rate. It starts from 100 messages per second for the system to 9,000 messages per second. So it plots the same values, minimum, low percentile, mode, high percentile, which is 75% of max, but it also plots the benchmark CPU, the amount of CPU that is used by the benchmark and the total CPU on your computer. So you see that at 9,000 messages per second, uh, my benchmark is using about 20% of the CPU. Now, what is the difference between this worst and best case? Worst case and best case. It took me a lot of time to figure this out. And it happened so that the method I used to publish messages in the benchmark, it uses Q timeouts to implement a fixed publish rate in each uh, worker loop. And it appears that all the timeouts for communication primitives fire on a millisecond boundary. This is the number of the message plot by the timestamp of the message. You see that 10 messages are fired about at the same time. And as a result, this is the amount of messages in the queue for the same thousand message batch. You see messages sit in the queue for a long time. There are, might be nine messages in the queue and it takes time to take them out and process. So this is why you got a wider distribution here. So if you inject a sub millisecond delay into your worker loops that publish the messages, you can improve your message sending time. And I call this a staggered mode. There is no contention for access to the actor queue and Messages don't sit in the queue anymore. You see 100% of messages are taken out of the queue before the next one is sent. So this explains the difference between the best and the worst case scenario. And your real life applications would fall somewhere in between. Now, last thing is higher message rates. This is a simulation of a large actor system. Uh, the message rate is 20,000 messages per second, 20,000. It has 30 actors, 60 topics, 158 publishers, and 170 subscribers. This is the histogram of propagation delay. 25% of messages are delivered within half a millisecond, and 75 are delivered within 900 microseconds. But if you look at this plot, the CPU usage, your benchmark is burning between 45 and 50% of CPU on just shuttling the messages, which is kind of not acceptable, but it's a good stress test because I verified that I don't have any memory leaks in the system. So speaking of the benchmark, I wouldn't recommend using this message broker like for messaging at above maybe 10 or 15,000 messages per second. Yeah, that's the cat. You can take a snapshot. Uh, and the last thing is I'm comparing here on message delay when you use message queues, when actors are based on message queues, the red one, and actors are based on user events. Here you see that if you use Levy queues, your messages are delayed less and you get more throughput than when you use user-defined event. If you want to see more details, uh, I will upload the slides and you can go through this. Uh, probably this is a couple of slides. 
what we have here is a summary of the effort and code size. I have, I've measured time it took me to create a local message broker, distributed message broker, actor templates, etc. And the message, local message broker is a total of 88 methods or type and type devs and 10 classes. Distributed adds another eight classes and another 82 methods. Actors are small. Unit tests require only 49 methods. And the total is like 250, 350 with the benchmark. And over five years, this all took uh, about 85 days or 17 weeks. So it was a major effort. And this is a list of things I still need to do. You can look at them later. These are the pros and the cons and the cons of the message broker. So I don't see any cons, but I see a lot of pros. You can look at them later on. And again, this is what is in the abstract. Message broker allows you, enables four types of actor decoupling. This is spatial decoupling, temporal decoupling, synchronization decoupling and semantic decoupling. And that's about the same things that uh, uh, the messenger library uh, was talking about. Okay, references, actor specific and design pattern specific, also in the slides, all live links. All right, and thanks questions. Dimitri. I think the audience is very eager to start interacting with you. And we're just about at the end of our session time. Okay. So you can take a couple quick questions here, just feeding in from the chat, and then we to all move over to the breakout session. Um, so just a couple quick questions. Uh -huh. um, Eric Jensen asked whether subscribers should use the filter mechanism to ensure correct data type. So that since publishers do not send messages with specific mm -hmm. data types. Uh, no, subscribers <coughs> should check on the incoming data type. And I make it easy because every message has a subject and for each subject, you know, it's data type. And the uh, purpose of message filtering is to do message translation or reduce the message rate. So these are two different purposes. Okay, great. And then Stephen Mercer had a question, um, just asking me if you could call out exactly where the message translation was being done, for example, from XML to JSON. And I believe the slide was in regards to the message broker commanded message flow that was early on in the presentation. Okay, the first question, message translation is always done at the publisher side because publisher has a copy of uh, the message filter object. And the benefit of this is that a message does, if a message doesn't need to be sent, it's not sent at all, neither to proxy nor to anything else. And since this is done on a per subscription basis and one actor one may want like a 50 Hertz rate and another one Hertz rate, uh, they both receive what they want. Okay, great. And I think that was most of the questions. Um, James Powell had some additional comparisons to his messenger library. So specifically. Yeah, but we can do it yeah, in a breakout. Sounds room. good. All right. Thanks, Dimitri. I'm going to post the link to the breakout session. And then if you can maybe take a quick break and head over there. Sure. Yeah, I'm heading over All there right. in five minutes. Thanks, everybody, for coming and listening for an hour. All right. Thank you. Okay, I'm out.